me in your Bible, if you will, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. While you're turning there, let me do a little more along the line of announcing. Tommy mentioned a few moments ago, we've got another pig picking and gospel sing coming up. First Saturday in March, that's March the 3rd. Uh, still some details to be worked out, but we will be having with us uh, again, Lord willing, from last year, the Wooten family from Pine Tops, uh, the, the choir from Bethany United Methodist Church over in Long Cheese, and then another group, new group, that uh, I'm halfway familiar with, a group by the name of Steadfast from Windsor, North Carolina. Uh, we'll plan on singing, starting our singing probably about 6 o'clock. Of course, we'll be eating earlier than that. But anyway, be sure to mark that on the calendar. Uh, one final word about Children's Church. Began brand new this morning. Uh, at this point, we're going to be meeting for Children's Church the first Sunday of each month. The first Sunday of each month only. Uh, as things progress, we may pick up on that schedule, don't know yet. But at this point, first Sunday only Children's Church upstairs in the uh, room we've been having it for a long time. And then the other three Sundays or whatever of the month, our children will just join us here in the auditorium. But uh, anyway, just be sure and, and uh, keep that in mind and keep it in your prayers as always. All right, John chapter 20. I'm going to pick up reading with verse number 1. John 20, verse number 1. A message I've entitled, Why... We study the Bible. Why we study the Bible. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they both ran, excuse me, they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Again, the uh, message title this morning, Why We Study the Bible. Now, Jesus, uh, for time frame, uh, focus, hosted, if you will, the Last Supper on Thursday night, if you recall. Thursday night of Crucifixion Week. Later that night, he was betrayed, he was arrested. Friday morning, he was tried, and then, of course, crucified. Our text today picks up verse 1, the first day of the week. That's, of course, Sunday. And not only Sunday, but from that day forward, it would always be known as Resurrection Day. Resurrection Day. Now, to the student of the book of Genesis, you know that Sunday, or the first day of the week, is also creation day. God created the heavens and the earth on Sunday. To the student of the New Testament, you also know Sunday as the Lord's Day. You know that it's why we worship on Sunday, because it's the day He rose from the dead. And you also know that it's the New Testament Sabbath day. Verse 1 also tells us that Mary Magdalene, came to Jesus' empty tomb. Verse 2, Mary finds Peter and John and tells them, and I hope uh, you paid attention uh, as I read a moment ago, she said, listen, they have taken away the Lord, and we know not where they have laid it. Did you notice that? 
Now, what we uh, is she talking about? You recall, of course, earlier, verse 1, we're told Mary went to the tomb. And verse 1 mentions no we, only Mary. Right? So what's the deal? What are we looking at here? Well, obviously, the we is discovered uh, in what we as Bible students know as the parallel passages, i.e., Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We've got four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Typically, the first three are referred to as the synoptics. In other words, you see the same thing, basically, in those first three. John is very similar, but all of them can be, uh, very legally, lumped into one. They're all four accounts of the Gospel. But for our purposes here, Matthew 28, 1, we're told that both Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, went to the tomb. Mark 16, 1, we're told that a woman by the name of Salome also went to the tomb. Luke 24, 10, we're told that a woman by the name of Joanna and other women also went to the tomb. Thus, we, right? There are four gospel accounts. They're penned by four different men. But students of the Bible, of course, know that God is the author of all four. Somebody says, well, how do you know that? It's a good question. It deserves a good answer. And thank God we've got one. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration of God is an uh, English phrase translated from one Greek word that literally means God breathed. God said it, and these four men, as well as all of our other writers, put down on paper what it is that God was saying. Now, our passage today, with all else that's communicated to us, is a perfect example of why we study the Bible. Why we study the Bible. Somebody says, well, why do we study the Bible? Well, first, and probably the best answer, because God tells us to study the Bible in the Bible. And we as disciples are developing the habit of doing what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Now, even if you don't believe that, now would be a good time not to be sitting there like a lump on the log not saying amen, all right? Because God says so. And we're developing that <coughs> dynamic between He and us. But He does tell us. First of all, we're told the priority of the study, that the study of the Bible is to have in our lives. The priority. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 2. You remember God says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. Why study the Bible? What kind of priority is it to have? As milk is to a newborn, so Bible study is to be to the disciple of Jesus. Now I hope this don't sound like a sermon to you. I hope it nails you right between the eyes. Anybody here ever been around a newborn baby that's hungry? They are not good at being ignored. Right, everybody? Do they just, you know, kind of sit to the side, well, I know mom's tired, and I know dad's got a ball game to watch, and there are siblings, and they've already had you know, to cook a meal for them. I'll just kind of lay here and quietly sit by until they have a chance to deal with me, right? Uh, what an amazing thing. God puts things in ways that anybody can understand. Most folks I know have been around babies, and those that haven't probably were one at one point. They squall like banshees to get food. Right? The only time a baby don't cry when it's feeding time is when he's sick. Right? Mm -hmm. Now you can help me or you can sit there. The choice is yours. I'm going to preach till I get done. The only time he don't cry is when he's not hungry. So the Bible says, listen, this is the priority that the Word of God being studied 
things to have in your life, just like a baby wants his milk. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that, what that translates into is now. <laughs> now, if possible, earlier than now. <laughs> Not only are we told the priority to study the Bible is to have, we're told how to go about this thing, the study of the Bible. Proverbs 2, the first six verses, best place I know of to find out how we're to go about this thing. I borrow five uh, clauses from that passage. We're first to incline our ear. We're to apply our heart. We're to cry out after. We're to seek it like we do money. We're to search for it like we would hidden treasure. Anybody here ever comes by a map of your backyard in which you're told Blackbeard's treasure is buried under the X? I wonder how many of us would go rent a shovel, a backhoe, or your next door neighbor's kids and have the yard dug up. Well, I didn't find it tonight, but as soon as I get home from work, I'm going to start digging again. Hidden treasure, right? And if that one don't grab you, how about just the pursuit of money? What degree of energy do you expend daily to earn a living for your family? Well, you know, I work uh, about two or three hours a week is when I ain't got nothing better to do. No. Forty hours a week, probably a bare minimum for, for a lot of you here, whether you're doing it now or used to. Sometimes we just work till we're done, right? Why? Well, I love to work. No, you don't. Why do we do that? It's to make money. It's to provide a living for our family. Amen. God says, if you want to understand my book, you're going to have to seek it like you do money from your employer. The same degree of energy that we put for making a living, we're supposed to put toward the study of the Word of God. Now, obviously, you can't put that much time. Work is a commandment of God. We've got to have time for work. We're not talking about the same amount of time, but the same degree of heart that we give to the pursuit of money. That's to be the, uh, how we go about this thing, the study of the Bible. Not only the priority, how we go about it, but thirdly, we're told the benefits of the Bible study. And these are generic answers, obviously, but I hope they make the point. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, right? Out of those 176 verses, 171 of those verses tell us what to do with God's Word and the benefits in so doing with God's Word. Somebody said the Word of God, the study of the Word of God, the Bible, is the one product on the market today with no fine print, no disclaimers, and no possible ill side effects. Right? I saw a TV commercial the other day and down in the fine print was fine print insurance company. <laughs> now don't you know you want to be hooked up with them? And you dial their number when your car's been crashed? And it says, sorry, this number's been disconnected, chump. Huh? Right? How about the disclaimers? Uh, I love it on the TV screen where uh, they're uh, advertising lawyers that will help you when you're injured or when you've taken some pill that's got the side effects and so on and so forth. And down at the bottom in small print, you get your binoculars out like me, you start reading in there. Well, this don't apply in 46 of the 48 continental states of the United States. And if you happen to live in the other two, it only applies the second Tuesday of each week. And that's just if you're related to our former president who's left the country and so on. You know what I'm talking about? Ain't none of that in the Word of God. And then the, the uh, side effects. This is the one that fascinates me. There's a, a, some kind of new cream they've come out with to put on your skin if you've got some kind of disease on your skin. And it'll help you wonderfully if it don't, according to this commercial, if the side effect don't kick in and you die first. <laughs> side effect, said right on TV, accidental death. Well, if your face is bad enough, you'd just soon try dying and fix it. <laughs> the only product you'll find anywhere, there ain't no fine print, no ill side effects, and no disclaimers. Nowhere. Amen. Nowhere. 
I got my uh, instruction book out the other day from some machine I was working on. <laughs> and you know, on the front page, front cover of those things, it, it told me to be sure to copy down the model number of my Gizmwiz so that when I call for replacement parts that I'm never supposed to have to call for, I'll have everything right. So I looked at my uh, 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 book that came with the machine and gave a model number. Then I looked on the machine and it had a different model number on it. And I thought, they've got me right where they want me. What's your model number? Well, we ain't got no machine with that model number. Bye. Not in the Word of God. It's simply not there, and I'm glad for it. In our John 20 passage, we have demonstrated for us a practical example of why we must study the Bible. Mary Magdalene don't equal we. I hope you caught that. <laughs> so it demonstrates perfectly for us that the study of the Word of God is a necessity. A necessity. I mean, just think about it, if you will. The Bible is made up, somebody, how many books? 66 books. How many chapters? I heard some, I think it was Tom, 1189 chapters, right? In the Old Testament, there are 39 books made up of 929 chapters. New Testament, 27 books made up of 260 chapters. And by the way, that's a bunch of chapters, right? It's a thick book. Mine goes up to 1,000 and then starts all over again. That's a long book. But all 1189 chapters have pertinent information. There ain't no soybean in the Word of God. And together, all of this makes up the whole. Together, it's a complete package. Amen. That's why this business about, well, I've got my favorite verses. Be careful with that. Nothing wrong with having favorite verses. But our ultimate favorite verses is Genesis 1-1 through Revelation 22-21. Because it's all making up the whole deal, the whole shooting match. And simple reason, if nothing else, alone tells us then that the Bible was designed to be studied. You, know, you, you, you can't pick up the Bible and read the book of Lamentations and come up with everything you need to know about God. Amen. Right? Some of you are thinking, Lamentations? <laughs> Which book is that in? <laughs> The Bible is not a volume of spiritual writings by various people compiled by an editor, submitted to a publisher for distribution. That's not what it is. The Bible is God's Word. It's delivered and penned by approximately 40 different writers spanning 2,000 years in its makeup all of whom specifically designated by God, and each of these including the various pieces that make up the whole. The Bible is inspired. That means it's God's breathed. It's inerrant. That means it ain't got nothing wrong in it. It's infallible. It can never fail. It is in total. It means it's absolutely complete, never to be added to, never to be taken from. That's why in our account alone, if you only read, just as a for instance, back up into last week, if you read John 19, 41 and 42, you could come along, or, or, or go away rather, thinking something along this line. Well, there's this guy Joseph of whoever, Arimathea. Uh, he must be a good guy, and evidently he's trying to help out this homeless preacher whose high ideas had gotten him killed. He had no money, no capable friends. So old Joe here is obviously taking care of his final expenses, as they call it on TV. And that's about all we know about that, if you only read John 19, 41, 42. <coughs> Yo, that ain't the end of the story, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 9, 700 years earlier was it penned, told us that Messiah had to die. And that in his dying, it was going to include the wicked and the rich. The wicked and the rich. 
You go to Mark 15, verse 27, and we're told that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Wicked. Matthew 27, 57 tells us Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. In fact, the word rich there translates into, if you will, uh, in modern vernacular, he was plumb, blowed out, filthy, no account rich. More money than he knew what to do with. Then, go back to the 12 verses that make up Isaiah 53, and God says, and you'll excuse a paraphrase here, if you see a righteous man die with wicked men, if you see a despised man, a smitten man, an oppressed man, a slaughtered man, buried by a rich man, there's a good chance you're looking at the Messiah. Now guess what? Those that put him on the cross didn't know the importance of Bible study. Or they would have seen something. They would have seen what me and you are supposed to see. Man, John 20 is the perfect example of why we study the Bible. Now just a quick sideline here, and I hope it don't hurt anybody. We've got detractors in the Christian faith. You say detractors, that's what you plowed the field with. Huh? No, no, no. <laughs> We got people that don't agree with us. There are people who are against the plain Bible. There are liberal Christians. And folk like these love to point at passages like this and say, look here. John 20 verse 1 says one thing. Mark 16 verse 1 says something else. I.e., there are discrepancies in the Word of God. No, they're not. Amen. Not one, not two, not nary a one. Anybody ever tells you that, say, fine, bring it out, show it to me, and we'll talk about it. And that's when they start backpedaling. No, 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 no. John 20 is not a discrepancy. John 20 is a part of the whole. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make up the whole, and that's why we study the Bible. Not just our favorite passage. So who studies the Bible? Well, you'll love this one. A Bible student. Student, you know, and I'm getting way out of my field here. Student is the noun form of the verb to study. Are you a student? Am I a student? Somebody's thinking, that's what we pay you for. I'm glad you didn't say that out loud. Because <laughs> I got something for you. <laughs> We're supposed to be Bible students. We're supposed to study the Bible. Who is it? It's someone who has realized what it is at stake. Who studies the Bible? Somebody who knows he needs the Bible. You don't study the Bible so you can get smart. You don't study the Bible so one day you can impress God. You don't even study the Bible so you know how to answer your detractors. You study the Bible because in it you found Christ. That's why Paul and Peter said 1 Peter chapter 2, not verse 2, but verse 3. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be you have tasted that God is gracious. Amen. Who here has got a favorite food? Anybody? Jerry, you're the only one in here? <laughs> to look at you, I can understand some of you is kidding. But then there's others of you. I don't have a favorite food. I have basically favorite food. In fact, most things, if it's food, it's my favorite. I like to eat, y'all. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons you don't ever have to call me twice when it's supper time. A lot of times I'm sitting there at the table. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I hate to admit this. I, mean, I don't eat for my health, y'all. I, I probably should. I'm assuming some of what I eat is healthy. I eat because it tastes good. They'd say, hey, eat this shoebox. That'll help you live longer. I don't want to live that long. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a chili dog. <laughs> now that's health food. I mean, that's wheat for the uh, bun and the what? <laughs> Ve veggies for the slaw and the relish and then protein. That's like... That's what you call mystery meat. And who knows what it is, but it's like meat. And just on and on. 
I like me a chili dog because I've had one before. I like the Word of God because I've had some of it before. Who's going to study the Bible? The one who knows. Listen, I need what it's got. I want what it's got. It's worth whatever time and energy I've got to put in it because it's going to help me. Amen. It's easy to act saved when you're in church. I mean, I know that. If God could use a crow to preach and a donkey to preach, I ain't got a whole lot to be bragging about. But I can stand up there and holler and somebody thinks, well, he's probably saved. Well, you don't really know that. But you know where being saved really comes in handy? It's tomorrow. Amen. When it ain't nobody but just me, when it's nobody but just you, and you're out there in the trenches and all of a sudden something goes wrong. And you can do like people in the world, you know, get a shot of dope or go talk to a psychiatrist or who knows what. Or you can turn to your Savior. He's the guy that earned the title of saving people. He can pick you up no matter where you are. Lift your feet out of the miry clay. Set your feet upon a rock. Put a new song in your heart. Even praise to your God. Ain't nothing happened but just you and Jesus standing out there in the yard all by yourself. But you go away a different person. That's when it's good. So that's why who studies the Bible? Somebody who's tasted it and knows that it's so. I want to be a student of the Word of God. But that leads us to this question. This is one you don't like. If you got a hearing aid, cut it off, short circuit it, stick your neighbor's fingers in your ears, do something. But I'm going to try and answer the question, who don't study the Bible? We know who does. Who don't study the Bible? Number one, lost people. Why would lost people study the Bible? They're busy out committing sins. Exodus 5.2, Moses strides into Pharaoh's office and says, Hey, you need to let us go because God said. Pharaoh knew no shame and didn't try and act holy. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? I don't know him. Most people don't know God. That's why this business is trying to invite people to church. Why won't you come to church? We preach the Bible there. Their real answer would be, that's why I don't want to come to church, because they preach the Bible there. <clears throat> Most people ain't going to study the Word of God. They're not going to be students. You ever find yourself witnessing to someone who all of a sudden it becomes obvious? They don't want you to witness to them. They want to argue with you. You know? You're a Christian. You've been saved 30 years. You study the Bible. I don't know nothing about it. Could care less. But I'm going to tell you what the Bible said. No, you won't. You may make me mad. I may make you mad. But you ain't going to argue me by something you don't know. Anybody following me here? Listen, I'm not trying to be ugly. But don't give a lost person any more credit than they need. They don't know the Bible. And they don't want to know the Bible. And that's, of course, why they don't study it, because they're lost. They've got busy things to do. Who don't study the Bible? Well, backslidden people don't study the Bible. They're too busy with their new God. Right? Jeremiah chapter 2, verse number 13. God said an amazing thing. He says, in fact, this is an amazing thing. My people have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewed them out cisterns, there's our word, Tommy, broken cisterns that don't hold any water. That's how God views anybody that slides back from a relationship with Christ. I sure am sorry I got saved. I sure am sorry I can turn to God anytime I want to through Jesus' name and always have my needs met. No, 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 no. We get mesmerized by something coming down the pipe. You'll forgive me for saying this. The only reason a man ever strays from being faithful to his wife is because something pretty comes walking down the road and catches his eye. Man, she's prettier than mama. I see, I can say this because she ain't in here today. <laughs> man, just look at them shoes she's got on. Look at that hat she wears. Oh, look at that vehicle. Look at that pickup truck she drives. You know? <laughs> And you don't stop and think, no, you know, mama may not be 19 anymore. A little 19 year old over here probably don't even know what a washing machine is. Much less she ain't cleaned your dirty socks.
sucks for the last 40 years? Mm -hmm. Huh? Boom. Cook? Anybody that skinny don't know about cooking? Why would you want to leave mama for some skinny woman who don't even own a kitchen? You ain't bright, that's why! I want to eat! <laughs> hey, the dude with a book said, for better or worse, that includes food, amen? <laughs> but no, anybody, they'll veer off the straight and narrow because he's looking at something brand new and God says they've left, they've left me. I'm a fountain of living water and they pick them up a broken bucket that won't even hold water. A backslidden person won't study the Word of God. He's too busy following after his new little G-God. There's things I've got to do, places I've got to go, people I've got to meet. God can keep His Word. Don't bother me about it. That's who don't study the Word of God. Lost people don't study it. Backslidden people don't study it. Now, you ain't going to like this one a bit. Lazy Christians don't study the Bible. Now, even if you can't amen me for you, amen me about somebody you know. How about that? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6, Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Anybody ever been thirsty? Mm -hmm. I'm talking thirsty. Yeah, your tongue sticking to the roof of your mouth. You remember that water bottle you emptied three hours ago? Got my truck the other day to go get me a soda. I left my money at the house. I thought to myself, I never thought I'd go use a credit card to buy a Diet Pepsi. <laughs> but when you get desperate, you get desperate. People that are hungry and thirsty for the things of God are those who are going to be filled. But a lazy Christian I had this demonstrated to me yesterday. A lazy Christian's no longer hungry. He's no longer thirsty. When the waiter from heaven comes to your spiritual table and says, you need me to top off that sweet tea? No thanks. I'm fine like I am. I thought, whoa, this hurts. I need to change my thinking pattern. You see, when we get lazy, we're just like the person sitting at the table. No, I'm full. No thanks. Have all I want. Thank you. Don't need no more. Or, I'm fine just like I am. Hey, we're not fine just like we am. We need the Word of God more tomorrow than we do today. Amen. This business about, well, I've got old. I ain't looking at nobody. I got old. I don't need the Word of God anymore. You are barking up the wrong tree, horse killer. I come across this thing the other day. Psalm number 92, verse 13 through 15. Don't have time to go through all of it. But it speaks about people being planted in the house of God. Planted. I ain't talking about burying dead saints under the floor like the Catholics. Planted in the house of God. Says, even when they're old, they bear fruit. Mm -hmm. I thought, wait a minute. I need to get me some scissors and some tape and start taping in some pictures of some old saints I know that are planted in the house of God and they're bearing fruit when they're old. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'd point out some of y'all in here today, but you'd get mad. I ain't old. <laughs> what's the opposite of that you see a lazy Christian is not planted in the house of the Lord producing fruit when he gets up you know what a lazy Christian looks like a plastic flower this mm -hmm. Ann ain't here I can talk trash about these plastic flowers <laughs> and there get plastic flowers on the communion tables about like a dude in a box dead oh don't he look good no he looks dead. <laughs> I mean, come on, somebody, help me. Amen. Oh, he looks so good. Man, what are you talking about? I don't look forward to them putting makeup on me, combing my hair the wrong way. I went in one one time and they had the dude's glasses sideways on his nose. Don't he look good? No, he looks drunk now. <laughs> Plastic flowers, don't they look real? No, I'm 
sorry. Better to have them plastic than not at all. They don't look good. They look phony. Amen. Well, I see you don't agree with them. <laughs> You're praying I'm going to tell Miss Ann. <laughs> I'd rather have plastic than not at all, y'all. But listen, in God's house, plastic flowers is not a good way to describe me and you. Lazy Christians don't study the Word of God because we feel like I don't need it. Hey, I've had all I need. Y'all care to go from here on and you no longer have roots and in your old age you won't bear fruit. You'll be listed up in the Hall of Fame out there in the church vestibule somewhere, our preceding members, and still be alive. Some of y'all didn't get that. <laughs> Man, who don't study the Bible? Lost people don't. Backslidden people don't. Lazy Christians don't. One last one. Who don't study the Bible? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Why would a hypocrite study the Bible? You'd almost think they'd want to study just to get their script. Yeah. How am I supposed to act? How am I supposed to talk? How am I supposed to look? But you see, hypocrites just put on a show. Yeah. Just put on a show. Mm -hmm. Oh, studying the Bible takes work, amen? Mm -hmm. I got ready to mess up this morning. I thought I mess up enough, I don't need to try. <laughs> 66 books of the Bible. And don't worry, I ain't going to put you on the spot. Does anybody, has anybody ever memorized all 66 books? Yeah. I'm talking about the titles, not yeah. 1,100. Yeah. Two of y'all there? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm going to say all of them up in front of the church this morning. <laughs> and about 15 megaseconds later, I thought, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I can't even remember Amazing Grace in church. I know I ain't going to try that. Y'all study is work. It's hard work. And, 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 I, and I commiserate with, with, uh, with y'all and you got to be careful with this, you working folk, I mean, not that you retired people don't work. Retired people are the busiest people I know. But for those of y'all who still go to work and come home tired, or wake up tired, go to bed tired, you know, work tired, man, I ain't got time for nothing. You've got to make time for studying the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You've got to. Say, well, I go to church. we got to... Preaching is long-winded and loud and don't ever shut up. Don't do it. <laughs> He'll teach me what I need. No, I can't. Preaching's a part of it. Thank God for it. I don't know the part it plays. But we've got to have it publicly in the body, but we've also got to have it privately in our own home somewhere. We've got to. And it's work. It's effort. My wife was one of these types in school. She'd have the record player. Back in the days when there were records. And you all know what I'm talking about? Stewart Jr. back there thinking, a record? What is a record? It's this big round thing. <laughs> She'd put a stack of records on. Nat King Cole, Doris Day. Not, not the Bee Gees or nothing. Else. Had the TV playing in the other room. Doing her homework. Y'all, I'd look at that thing, you know, diagram this sentence. I'm thinking, why? <laughs> and then diagram, was it, draw a picture of the sentence. And you know, an hour and a half later, I'm still, st my mama said she used to come into the room and peek in the door and I'd be staring in the same place in the same book I was an hour ago. And all I needed was somebody to put on a stack of records or turn the TV on, and I am history, y'all. I'm out of here. It is work to get in this thing. And the idea is not to become a Bible smart guy. It's just to get in the habit of, since I've tasted that God is gracious, I didn't just hear it. I want to get in there and find out what more he's got to say. You say, well, does he really talk to you in there? Yeah, he do. Yeah, how does he do it? Just as a, for instance, I was reading in the book of Exodus this week and came across Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a piece of work, y'all. Pharaoh, I don't know God, and could care less. Oh, 
Well, that was a heathen. Yeah, just like I was a few years ago. I didn't know God could care less. And I looked down there at Pharaoh in Exodus 5 and I thought, you know what? This is what James is talking about. It's a mirror. I see me in there. Oh, I turn the page. We'll do better than that. We go about four pages further, and Pharaoh said, Listen, not only do I not know your God nor care about your God, Moses, if you ever come in here again, I'll kill you. But what a wicked man! And then I thought back about all them times, all them Christians just trying to shove Jesus down my throat, and I never did, but I wanted to cold cock him. I don't want it! I don't want it! <laughs> Wait a minute, there I am in the book. Now, I don't know all God's doing, but one thing I know, when I look at a passage like that, that's God showing me what I am. It's God talking to me about, this is how your lost friends are. It's right there in front of us. Well, I wonder why they won't come to church when I invite them. I wonder why old so-and-so in church won't do you know, what he sees he needs to be doing there. Go over to the book of Jonah. God says, go this way. A mirror. You can't see what you look like unless you get in a mirror, right? Amen. Now, some of y'all, that's a, that's a horrifying thought. Went across the, a, a mirror in some public place the other day, and I had my orange hat on. One well, my wife likes so good. And uh, my britches were sagging down. Like they always do. A little raggedy looking Paris. I don't remember what it was. I looked over there and thought, that's a shame in this world. <laughs> Every night I go home, I have to kiss her feet for staying with me. Just to look. <laughs> in this world, you know. Without a mirror, you don't see that. Without the Word of God, we can't know where we stand, where we're headed, what we're doing. There's David. Look at that rascal out there carousing with other women. He already had 19 wives at the house. A mirror. It's work and it's revealing. But y'all, one last thing and I promise I'll hush. It's how you bust it down. It's how a year from now you won't be struggling with the same thing you are now. Right here. Thanks be unto God. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, who causeth us always to triumph in Christ. Hallelujah. Now that's not a politician's promise. And you know about them. Mm -hmm. I promise, fill in the blank, anything you want to put there, till November. <laughs> uh, it's the real deal. God's good to us, isn't he? Yeah. Why do we study the Bible? Because we need it. Right there. I'm going to ask you to bow with me.